Hey everybody and welcome back to our third episode of our gaming section here, our brand new gaming section. Me and my research team have brought you a couple of interesting news articles, two games and two bits of industry drama, one huge bit of drama in particular. Stay tuned because we also have a brand new section at the end of each episode going forward about games coming out next week. I hope you enjoyed this episode so let's kick it off. In a two-part DLC, we begin on a school trip to Kitakami and introduce a few new characters and annoying rivals. The dialogue is as boring and bland as ever. The DLC is quite short with main quest taking around three hours if you focus on it with some side quests along the way for good measure. The Pokedex for this region caps out at 200 with 100 of these Pokemon being from the Paldea region. Nearly all of the others are from previous generations. A lot of the evolves are a bit more complicated featuring special items stones, being traded, friendships, etc. So don't expect to just level them all up with a lot of rare candies that you may have to spare. There are four new legendary Pokemon including Ogidogi, Monkeydor, Fezendipity and Ogrepan, which has multiple forms. One good thing is that they finally fixed the speed of scrolling through Pokemon boxes so it doesn't look as if it was lagging like it was since the original base release. I don't think you need a DLC for this as it appears to be a fix. Level range of the Pokemon appearing in the new area start from around the mid 50s and work their way upwards. For some god benounced reason you get a selfie stick for taking selfies for your floating Rotom phone. Once again your floating phone needs a selfie stick. Which makes no sense, and I've ranted enough on my stream about that already. You also get a new selection of uniforms and customizations for your character early in the storyline. A new mini game, which varies in difficulty, to get a shiny Munchlax as a reward in the end if you do complete the hardest level. There's also a new team, like Team Star in the base game. These are called Ogre Clan, featuring trainers with semi-competitive teams in the 70s. You can now filter learnable TMs at the TM machines, including many TMs to Violet and Scarlet, most of which can be picked up on the ground. It's an okay DLC for what it is, and it is a one of two parts, so here's hoping part two might be a little bit more spicy. But as a gaming experience, it's subpar, just like pretty much whatever the Pokemon company seems to deliver to us, a subpar gaming experience at the very least. Is it worth $35, half of the cost of the base game? Absolutely not. Unless, of course, you are a die-hard Pokemon mega fan. Mm. Now, next up is a little bit of industry drama for a favorite PlayStation, but um, I'm not quite sure where to go with this particular one. Let's look on, shall we? Currently set to release on November 15th, after being announced at the PlayStation Showcase earlier this year, current pre-order cost is $200, making it the lowest of all the current cloud gaming handheld devices, such as the Switch and Steam Deck, an 8-inch screen, which is a fine screen size, and 1 inch larger than the Steam Deck, a 1080p resolution with 60Hz frame refresh rate which should provide a clear and crisp gaming experience, Android OS with easy to use interface, access to streaming cloud gaming requiring no internal game storage and that's kind of where the positives end for this one realistically and it's as if they sliced a PlayStation 5 controller in half and glued it together onto an 8 inch screen. The portal has no internal storage and runs entirely by remote play from your PlayStation 5 over Wi-Fi networks. Technically, you can use this outdoors as long as your PlayStation is turned on and you have a good Wi-Fi in transit or in a hotel you may be staying at. Yeah, right. Good luck with that one. See, and that's the thing, I still don't understand who this product is actually catered for. Outside of some limited circumstances, like you're living with multiple other people and the only TV in your apartment or any sort of accommodation is currently occupied by, let's say, a family member or a flatmate. Or perhaps maybe you have some small children and you're playing maybe more of a violent or more of a graphic game and you don't want them to see it, so you can simply 
actually take it into your room and play it. Or maybe you want to play it, but you don't have a TV screen, so you're happy to play it on a handheld, but you still would need to have a PlayStation actually working to run it. But the thing is, you can still do this all for free with the app. The only difference is you're literally buying a screen. It's not as if you can download other games onto it as if it was a Switch or a Steam Deck. I don't quite know what PlayStation's strategy was here. Quite frankly, I don't even know what they were thinking with this one. See, the thing is, it costs $200 for a remote device, which you get as a free app on your mobile phone or iPad, and offers many of the same benefits and still relies on your Wi-Fi to be decent to stay connected. There is no Bluetooth, so you cannot connect to wireless. It does have a PlayStation Link feature, so they can push their new PlayStation Pulse wireless headset and earbuds, but it all seems to be a needless cash grab. Battery life is estimated to be about four hours of consistent playtime from a full charge on Tethered, but this battery size was not yet finalized at the time of writing. So just to clarify, there's no offline playability. And next up we have FF7, because of course we love a good FF7 game. There's another FF7 game, another spin-off of some description on the infamous Final Fantasy VII. This is Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis, and produced by our lovely favourite developers of Square Enix, which can do no wrong. Wait, that doesn't sound right. One second, I have to consult with my script. Ah. Oh. Okay, it does appear that, yes, Square Enix can do us wrong, and let's explain why. Ever Crisis is a mobile phone-based free-to-download Final Fantasy VII game released on September 7th, so you know it includes plentiful gacha mechanics. The graphic style of this game is described as a nostalgic visual twist with a chibi graphical take on the original and remake of Final Fantasy VII. During open world gameplay, graphic style is closer to the original. During combat gameplay, it's closer to the remake. The game features storyline from all over the FF7 compilation timeline, including Zack's life as a soldier, Cloud and the Gang's original OG adventure, Vincent's story circa Dirge of Cerberus, parts of Advent Children, and even the other smaller spin-offs. But it will also also include an all new additional storyline into the first soldier and soldier project zero story which have been heavily featured in trailers and teasers for this release this part of the game will focus on three soldiers which are all part of the soldier project zero it will also feature the crowd favorite sephiroth one of gaming's most iconic characters as a young soldier. Getting back to the gacha mechanics, this game will feature loot boxes and special weapons available for purchase because we just love loot boxes. We just love gacha mechanics. Do you need more gacha to get ya? To gacha? I gotcha. So let's talk about some of the pros here. The battle system is streamlined in a very effective manner that allows players to change between stances, making the ATB style battle easier on a touch device, if the skills are equipped, but more on this in the negatives. Beautiful graphics and great soundtrack according to most reviews. But let's bring on some of the cons. Menu selections and options are very messy and have no shortcuts requiring players to open menu, on menu, on menu. Do you want to have some more menus on your menus? Menu Inception? Well, welcome to FF7 Ever Crisis, where we deliver you menus upon your menus. Here's your menu. Can I take your order? Ah, more menus. Examples would include equipping materia and changing skills and weapons. Movement through the world map environment is glitchy and sometimes is difficult to navigate with no control or interface. Also a gigantic negative which comes from the gotcha mechanics of the game that there is too much limited to the pay for play features. As such the materia and also the weapon limit breaks without paying are reported as seriously nerfed to force more people to force their hand and pay Square Enix a little bit more of their hard-earned money. Get out your wallets, gamers. It's time to pay. And just to take a quick look at some of the gaming reviews coming in at the moment, maybe this 
will just take getting used to, but it feels like my basic attacks take too long to recharge. I can't tell if it's real time or turn base or mix, but either way, it doesn't feel right to be able to use specials more often than basic. Other than that, the game is great. An amazing introduction to Final Fantasy VII since I haven't played it before. Don't know why I expected anything else. I guess I've been spoiled by so many great releases of late. The gameplay is superb and so is the story, but I cannot recommend this title because they have nickel and dimed everything. It is designed to extract maximum Money from you. It contains multiple gotchas to, in to unlock characters, gear and material as well as season pass as well as other things on top. And let's take user Archangel's next comment. I like the graphics and storytelling mode. It's the remake or remaster I want it to look like. The story is out in small missions and the atmosphere and immersion is cut short. The battle system is not interesting in manual. There is an auto mode for an idle manual battle mode. Not the game I was waiting for, for sure. Two stars for graphics and BGMs, nothing more here. So do with that information as you will, people. Check it out, it is free to play on mobile and have your own verdict. Now, some of the biggest drama we're going to definitely face over the last couple of days will be where gamers publishers and developers all united in saying what the beep were unity thinking so if people don't know unity is a game engine similar to let's say unreal engine but the problem is is that unity has made a few not so subtle changes to their licensing plans and it's causing quite a ruckus in the gaming uh, space. So let's have a look on. Unity has updated their licensing plans by removing the Unity Plus tier service, which was used by smaller indie developers. And it's replaced by the Unity Pro, which is much more expensive. But as of January the 1st, 2024, things get much more spicy, where Unity are introducing a B that is based upon each time a qualifying game is downloaded by an end user, which basically means that each time a game is downloaded, they charge you. So exactly how does this work? It works based on thresholds. Now the thresholds range uh, from the free and plus tier at 200k and then 1 million at the pro or enterprise tier, which makes a lot of sense for those uh, big game developers. They're gonna be pushing that 1 million. However, it's those at the 200K which are going to be seriously affected because these developers already are not making that much money. They already have so much other costs to pay back, such as publishing fees, such as, you know, people's wages, just the development time of the game, all those costs that have included. And now, you're going to have Unity having a major price increase, which could add on tens of thousands extra. And if you're just starting up and you're starting to get your first little bit of cash incoming from a game, if the game is any bit successful at all, you're not gonna most likely see a penny for a very long time. And remember guys, revenue does not mean profit. So let's just say for argument's sake, let's say the bill is due, you just made 200,000. You have to first consider your publisher, then you're gonna start uh, considering Unity. And that's already considering all the costs you've already associated in just building up this game, such as wage costs, paying for the electricity, etc., all that stuff. So Unity is gonna come after you right after all that, which seriously will cut into any potential profit. So what are the fees like, for example? So for those uh, reaching 200K, which would be those at the free and plus tier, we're looking at 20 cents per install, and then a scaling from 15 to two cents per install as they reach more than 1 million installs per month. So this is tracked on a per month basis. However, there is a caveat that if the app is installed in what is considered an emerging market, you'll pay a significantly lower rate. And that's because mobile games. Since mobile gaming is more popular in these countries, especially these free to play, it is seen as a significantly lower rate. Otherwise, those developers would be probably out of business very quickly. So at least on that end, it is somewhat considerate. However, the entire thing is a farce to say the least. You can also get credits to reduce the cost of your bill if you decide to put on Unity's extra tools such as adverts. 
Great, right? If a game is making a lot of dosh at the moment, they're getting a lot of installs, it might make more sense to delist the game so it's no longer available to be downloaded just to prevent this uh, incurring cost, which kind of makes a lot of publishers or will make a lot of publishers nervous uh, going forward and game developers as well. So it's going to affect both sides. And this fee does not apply, by the way, to film, gambling or education subscriptions at this time at this time so it's more like a trust me bro we won't do this yet so gambling of all the things you can think about does not have to worry with this however game and app developers do that sounds fair doesn't it that sounds so fair and according to unity these aren't even one on one hard numbers this is just going to be an estimate on what they're stating unity also noted that demos won't count and that's demos only if it's not on the same if it's not on the same build as what's out and then that also begs the question what about those those weekends that you may see every so often come free and join in on this game for this free weekend all those installs now will also start to cost. That's going to start costing you potentially tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. They did note that web and streaming games will count. Reinstalls won't count. But the thing is, is how does Unity know? How does this software that they'll have installed know if it is a reinstall? And also, if you install the game on multiple different devices that will also cost so technically you could download a game for free on your first mobile device but then you decide to upgrade or maybe you have two mobile devices that's going to be one cost per each install for that publisher that that developer so i don't know how they're going to track that reinstalls won't count as a publisher they're going to have to consider this new potential cost which makes them possibly not want to go and help smaller indie developers right now because the cost to them could be exponential and if we take another major developer of a game such as epic games who as you may know are the creators of unreal engine as i mentioned already so their editor is free basically what it seems to be for epic and unreal engine in this case is that we know it takes time to build money we know it takes time to build up your customer base so we're not going to touch you we're not going to charge you until you get to a comfortable position because we know that once you make money we will make money and that's when once you have made your first million that's when we're going to start charging you our five percent which is completely fair because once you make money we make money we're all happy everybody makes money and some other game engines are chiming in on this one easiest marketing they're ever going to get want to build games for ht lmm5 android ios windows linux etc yes go to default engine up upfront cost zero licensing fee zero ultp zero so with just a couple of these examples here you can see that there are developers of game engines out there who aren't there to just simply nickel and dime you yes it's a business we all understand businesses need to make money businesses have contractual obligations but not every single business needs to be so greedy as unity is being right now and that's it pretty much with all of the drama so it's going to be a very interesting development and it's going to be interesting for us as the audience viewing this fiasco but also it's going to be very hurtful for all the publishers and game developers who are currently using Unity. There are no doubt people who have been spending years making games that aren't even released yet and they already have a contract with Unity. Only now to find out possibly years into their development that their game is, could potentially cost them their livelihoods if it becomes a major hit. So what's coming out in this upcoming week? Well first we have Lies of P, a dark twist on the tale of Pinocchio with inspiration from Bloodborne evidently. Round 8 Studio is looking to deliver a spiritual successor with this souls-like entry as a humanoid Pinocchio battles it out against biomechanical foes. It steams ahead on September 19th.
Mortal Kombat is back with Mortal Kombat 1 serving as a sequel to number 11 and a series reboot with 22 reimagined characters from the past and a new feature called Cameo Fighters which will provide assistance to the player during fights. It features a story mode and online mode. There's also DLC called a Combat Pack featuring guest characters. It executes on September 19th. Payday 3 once again tasks you with pulling off the ultimate bank heist and escaping from the long arm of the law with your ill-gotten gains. The legendary quartet of thieves are back in action and ready to empty the pockets of New York City and take a few friends with you along the way. It's time to prove that greed is good. Payday 3 invades on September 21st. An adaption from the tabletop game and released on PC in 2021, Gloomhaven makes its way to consoles. Players assume the role of a band of mercenaries, exploring dungeons, killing monsters and fulfilling quests, each with a unique class of abilities and attacks selected through a card deck gameplay. Gloomhaven takes its turn on September 21st. And finally, Another 21st release, the iconic Resident Evil 4 Capcom team have added the infamous Separate Ways playthrough where you take charge of Ada Wong and see her side of the story to fill in numerous gaps. It will be interesting to see what's different versus the original. Separate Ways infects us on September 21st. And that's it everybody, I hope you enjoyed today's episode including that brand new section and all the drama as well. Sound off in the comments below what you think about Pokemon, what you think about the dramas incoming and also FF7. Have you played any of these games? What, what are your thoughts? What are your comments? Bring them down below for us and thank you so much for the support. Remember if you did like this video please help us with the YouTube algorithm gods and give it a thumbs up. If you are enjoying this content and want to see a lot more J cuts in the future, click on that subscribe button and check out all my other various social media down below. We have more updates to come in the not too distant future and some new additions into the channel as well. But until then, thank you very much for your time and I hope to see you soon. Take care. Goodbye. Shlansha.